start talking. Okay, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here and, and Golden, Eileen, I appreciate the introduction. This is the 43rd presentation I've been giving as I've given as part of this Darcy tour. And now I'm giving two different presentations, so it's not like I'm giving the same presentation every time. But it's a rather arduous uh, journey, this Darcy tour. And I gotta say, this year in particular, it's a tough gig for me. And the reason is, is I'm following Eileen. And I thought Eileen did an, an incredible job with the Darcy presentation when she came to the University of Kansas. Extremely clear presentation with a great uh, depth in terms of scientific content. So it's a little tough following in her footsteps. And every once in a while, I hear in the crowd, bring back Eileen. And I understand, but uh, I'm trying to stumble through here as best I can. Now, before I get started, a uh, couple of qualifiers concerning this presentation. I thought I'd like to start off with the title. Now, this title is considerably more flamboyant than the, title, uh, the titles I normally use in scientific presentations. Let me give you a little uh, explanation for that. I, uh, I thought this Darcy uh, lecture tour kind of a big deal, so I needed to come up with some special titles. So I came up with some titles, took them home for my family to review. And I've got, my wife's got a doctorate, and I've got two teenagers. So at the dinner table, I present my proposed titles. And I gotta say, my family let me know in no uncertain terms that my proposed titles were decidedly unexciting. And my teenagers, in fact, what I considered a stunning development, used this as a segue into a general discussion of the rather unexciting nature of their father. Now, <laughs> that obviously uh, impacted me and I slunk back to my office and came up with some new titles that I thought had a bit more pizzazz, presented them to my wife. She told me, that's the, that's the best you're capable of, Jim. So that's what I'm going with. So just a little explanation there on the title. Now, what I'm given here is a relatively general overview of some of the research my colleagues and I have been doing. And I'm trying to direct this at the students in the audience to try to get them excited about work in groundwater hydrology. Because I think it's a lot of fun and hopefully I'll be able to convey some of the excitement that I feel about the work in this presentation. Now, my philosophy here with these Darcy presentations is to work with relatively simple mechanisms and concepts and try to demonstrate how we can derive some fairly important insights from relatively, from apparent simplicity. Let me put it that way. Now, at the Colorado School of Mines, I know there's a great deal of expertise in groundwater hydrology, so I've added some material to this presentation to kind of beef it up for this audience. So this may go a little bit longer than my standard presentation. I'll try to speak fast, uh, but I apologize for going a little longer than normal. Uh, but I thought this group would find this additional material of interest. Interest. Now, one, thing, one other point I want to make clear is although the topic of this presentation is plant-water interactions, I am not a plant physiologist. In fact, I'm not a biologist of any ilk. Instead, I am a groundwater hydrologist. And what I hope to convince you of today is there's some benefit to be gained by viewing plant-water interactions from the perspective of a groundwater hydrologist. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get moving and start out with this rather dispiriting view of the Arkansas River in west central Kansas near the town of Larned. Now, many of you are familiar with the Arkansas River. It thunders through the Royal Gorge not too far south of here and then hits the High Plains. Now, prior to development, it was a gaining stream, a groundwater-fed stream over much of that High Plains. Well, things have changed today. And so here at Larned, after it's hit the High Plains, flowed out several hundred kilometers, it's lost a lot of that vigor that it displays there in the Royal Gorge. Now, 
my colleagues and I have been at this site for about the last six and a half years. And I hate to say it, but this is the Arkansas River at Larned on a relatively good day. Most of the time when you stand at this, look out from this vantage point, all you see is a wide swath of dry sand and gravel that was formerly known as the Arkansas River. And just as an aside to this group, uh, the Arkansas River is one of three rivers in the state of Kansas that's legally classified as navigable. Now, obviously, that now is via the ATV route. Um, but anyway, this is not some desert in Nevada or Utah. This is the heartland. We are not expecting to see our waterways in such a deplorable state. And so there was a great deal of outcry in the public, the citizenry of Kansas, about the Arkansas and other waterways in western Kansas, Kansas reaching this condition. So my colleagues and I at the Kansas Geological Survey got involved in studies of stream aquifer interactions, et cetera, to try to clarify the mechanisms that have led to this condition. My part of that was focused on the impact of nearby wells. These are wells pumping water for agriculture, irrigating, irrigation water for agriculture. And as I went and did these studies, I, it struck me that the impact of nearby irrigation wells was quite significant, that that irrigation pumping that pumping of, of groundwater for irrigation was playing a major role in this, uh, this lack of stream, uh, lack of water in our streams. So I would go around the state, the western half of the state, talking to various groups about my work and indicating how my findings were uh, pointing to nearby uh, pumping wells as a major culprit. And what I began to hear from a segment of the uh, community of, uh, uh, of, irrigated, of irrigators for agriculture, I began to hear them tell me the problem is not us being our, the pumping of groundwater for irrigation. The problem is them. And the them that they were referring to was the riparian zone vegetation particularly the large shrubs and trees that act as phreatophytes. And now to return to the title of this presentation, what the heck is a phreatophyte? Well, if the term phreatophyte actually was coined by a groundwater hydrologist back in the 20s. And it has Greek roots. You've got the Greek word for well, or the possessive case of the Greek word for well, phreatos, the Greek suffix for plant, phyte, so it's a well-like plant, a plant that sends its roots down to the water table, the capillary fringe, and depends on groundwater, either partially or wholly, for its water supply. So what these irrigators were saying was these phreatophytes in the riparian zone were intercepting groundwater that would otherwise have flown to the stream, and they were intercepting it to such an extent that the streams were not flowing. So the obvious solution here is to go and cut down all the riparian zone vegetation, and our rivers will flow again. Now, that struck me as a bit of a reach, but I didn't know too much about uh, plant-water interactions. About all I knew was, uh, okay, plants are primarily using water during the day as part of the photosynthesis process, not much at night. So I thought to myself, okay, if these phreatophytes are utilizing groundwater, we should be able to see a diurnal, a daily rise and fall in the water table as the plants use groundwater during the day and not at night. So I said, okay, as a first step in trying to address the, the concern of this, com uh, this community of irrigators, let's go into the riparian zones, stick in some shallow wells, equip them with water level sensors, and just record water level position through time and see if we can see this daily rise and fall in the water table. And this is nothing new. Others have done this before us, but I just wanted to show you what we saw. 
Uh, here's an example well that we had. Uh, I've got depth to water from land surface here on the y-axis. I've got time here on the x. And notice you, ha you can see clearly this cyclical rise and fall of the water table. But from this figure, it's unclear if that's happening on a daily cycle. So let's blow up five days of that record and see what we see. We've got 10 centimeters on the Y, we've got five days on the X, and each of the, ma the major tick marks on this and all following plots designate midnight. So what do we see? Well, we see a very clear pattern of the water level falling during the daylight hours, then coming up at night, falling again during the day, coming up. Very clear pattern fall, rise, fall, rise, that is consistent with the idea that these fluctuations are induced by free adiphyte activity, by plant water interactions. Now, I got very intrigued by these fluctuations. And I went into the literature, saw that they were first noted back around 1912, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and that the United States Geological Survey, in a period from about 20s to the early 60s, as a part of a lot of pioneering work on phreatophytes, had spent a fair amount of time looking at these uh, fluctuations. But since then, relatively little attention had been given to them. And what really struck me as interesting, that is in the plant physiology community, that little attention had been given to these diurnal fluctuations, these daily rises and fall in the water table. And it struck me that that was unfortunate because I thought there'd be a fair amount of information about plant water interactions embedded in these fluctuations. So as part of our work on phreatophytes to try to get a feel for how much groundwater they were using, my colleagues and I spent a fair amount of time looking at these diurnal fluctuations and trying to glean insights from them. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The, our work in this area has consisted of both a modeling and field component, but in the interest of time, I'm going to primarily focus on the field. I just mentioned some of the modeling stuff in passing a couple times, and I'm going to limit my comments as well to work at two field sites we have in western Kansas. Now, at each of these sites, our work has consisted of two phases. The first phase is to unequivocally demonstrate that the daily rises and fall in the water table that we've observed at these sites, is act, those fluctuations are a product of plant water interactions, of free adiphyte activity. Because one could invoke a wide variety of mechanisms to uh, explain rises and fall of the water table. So first phase at each of these sites, let's demonstrate that yes, these are a product of free adiphyte activity. And then in the second phase, let's see what insights we can glean from these fluctuations. Now, I'm going to describe both of those phases at one site, and then in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the first, uh, that first phase at the second site and just focus on the insights uh, that we could glean from them. Okay, so that's kind of where we're headed. In terms of the field sites, let me give you a little introduction. This is the great state of Kansas here. The noble and inspirational Jayhawk resides up here in the northeast corner. Now, what I've got here is Average annual precipitation shaded in 12 and a half centimeter increments. And so you can see that we've got a, a large gradient in terms of annual precipitation as we go from the wetter east into the drier west. Notice the blue lines on this graph. The, or this figure, these blue lines designate major perennial streams. Notice the sparsity of major perennial streams in the western third of the state. Now this uh, figure is based on 94 data, but essentially the same situation prevails today. However, the situation, this figure would have looked quite different if we had made a similar map in the 50s prior to widespread agriculture uh, development in this area and pumping of the Ogallala Aquifer for irrigated waters. Because prior to that period of widespread agriculture in this area, 
that we had a fair number of perennial streams. These were groundwater fed streams, gaining streams. However, once we started pumping the aquifer for water, the water table dropped and the aquifers were no longer feeding uh, groundwater into the streams and so the streams dried up. So we've got this sparsity of major perennial streams in the western third of the state, which is a recent uh, development in terms of, uh, of history. Now, you can see the Arkansas River comes in here from Colorado and then stops and only picks up there about halfway through the state. And notice I am pronouncing this word as Arkansas. Now, I recognize in this audience there could be some individuals who favor that other Arkansas pronunciation. But when you do that, remember that Arkansas pronunciation, that is pronunciation by legislative edict. In other words, you're basically just doing what the man says. But in Kansas, we don't do We follow a different drummer, okay? So it's our Kansas. Got it? Okay, that's one of the messages I'm trying to get out in this Darcy tour. Um, so we've got two field sites here. The first one is along the dry channel of the Arkansas River, LRS, the Larned Research Site. This is where I showed the earlier photo from. Now, this is a site that the, where the riparian zone is dominated by native vegetation. This would be the cottonwood, the willow, etc. And I'm going to describe both phases of our work at this site and then talk about some of this, give an example of the scientific insights we can glean from these diurnal fluctuations. And we've got a second site in far southwestern Kansas near the uh, Oklahoma border along the Cimarron River, the Ashland Research Site. And this site is do dominated, the riparian zone of this site is dominated by uh, invasive phreatophytes. These are phreatophytes that are not native to Kansas or the U.S. These come from Central Asia, from Uzbekistan, Xinjiang province in, Kansas, in China, and, uh, and have uh, moved in to the uh, riparian zones throughout the southwest. This would be the salt cedar for uh, the tamarisk, which is a problem in Colorado as well. At this site, we'll focus in on insights we can glean from these fluctuations that have policy significance or ramifications. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is go into the Larned Research Site and describe the set of monitoring set up there, give you a feel for the activities that we've been carrying out there. And then I'll just, uh, we'd have similar activities at the Ashland site. I just won't describe those in detail. Okay, so here's the Larned Research Site, a, cr a schematic cross-section of it. Um, a left to right, it's west to east. Uh, to the west of the riparian zone, we've got irrigated agriculture. East, we've got pasture land. The riparian zone in this area is about 150 meters in width. Notice the entrenched channel on the east side of the, of the riparian zone. Uh, originally, Prior to human alteration of upstream flow, the base of the channel was over here, but with the diminishment of flow from upstream areas, uh, we began to get vegetation growing on the original uh, base of the stream channel, and that then restricted flow to the east side and led to the entrenchment you see now. now the, the age of the vegetation riparian zone is mostly post mid 1960s. In the mid 60s, we had a large channel clearing flood in this area, which basically took everything out, especially on the west side. Maybe a few of the trees in a higher elevation east side uh, survived. It's not quite. We're not quite clear on that. Now, in terms of the subsurface, we've spent a lot of time defining the hydrostratigraphy of the shallow subsurface, this site. Let me go over it real fast. Uh, top 10, 11 meters, uh, unconsolidated coarse sands and gravels uh, that when saturated uh, constitute the Arkansas River alluvial aquifer. Then we've got a five or six meter thick clay unit termed the upper aquitard, and then six or seven meter thick uh, coarse sand uh, high plains aquifer underlain by another clay unit. Now this high plains aquifer is heavily tapped for irrigation supplies both underneath the site and to the east. 
that irrigation pumping in the high plains has altered the shallow flow of groundwater in the Arkansas River alluvial aquifer. Originally, groundwater from both directions fed the Arkansas River. This was a gaining a reach of the Arkansas River, but with continued, pump, continued pumping, the water table dropped in the shallow aquifer, dropped below the bottom of the stream channel, and we set up a gradient to the east, a hydraulic gradient to the east. Now, I've accentuated that gradient in this plot. It's really on the order of just a few to several centimeters over the distances displayed here because of the highly permeable nature of the shallow uh, coarse sands and gravels. Okay. We've spent a fair amount of time trying to monitor hydrologic conditions in a shallow subsurface. So from the, uh, for example, we've tried to spend a fair amount of time estimating how much water is contained between the water table and the land surface in the Vado, so unsaturated zone. We have eight neutron probe access tubes scattered across the site for this purpose. For those of you not familiar with the neutron probe, this is an active source sending out high energy neutrons, collide with hydrogen, come back as low energy neutrons from calibration relationships we can estimate how much water is contained in a unit volume of this zone above the water table the volumetric water content of the unsaturated zone so every two weeks during a growing season we're out there taking profiles of volumetric water content across the repairing zone in terms of the saturated zone below the water table, we have 14 wells, or Kansas River alluvial aquifer, two upper aquifer, four in the high plains. Each one of these is equipped with one of these integrated pressure transducer data logger units, sits in the water column in the well, measures the pressure exerted by the overlying column of water, takes a measurement of that every 15 minutes, stores it in an internal data logger, and we periodically download with handheld or laptop uh, PCs. And we have wells there with records for six or more years on 15 minute uh, increments. So that's what we have in terms of the subsurface hydrologic uh, conditions. In terms of the surface uh, repairing zone uh, conditions, we spend a lot of time trying to characterize the major players in the repairing zone community. We started out in 2002, basically laid a grid across the site, the full 150 meter width of the site, about 100 meters along this, the stream. We counted every tree of greater than eight centimeters in, diam in diameter at chest height. We identified the type, measured its circumference, uh, numbered it as you see here, GPSed in its location. So we were able to compute uh, the major players by cross-sectional trunk area, Cottonwood, the state tree of Kansas, was a major player, mulberry and willow and genus, that's populous, Morris and Salix. Now, the invasive species are uh, very uh, rare at this site. I think we have three salt cedar out of the 864 trees, and all of those are doing very poorly because the shade of the fast-growing cottonwoods has cut off the, uh, the, the fast-growing cottonwoods have cut off the light to the salt cedar. So we have a feeling for the major players in the repairing zone, and we've been tracking that every three years. Uh, we've gone out, and we'll do another one in uh, tree inventory in 2008 this coming summer. We've also spent some time looking at water flow up the trunk of the trees using these sat flow sensors. These are two needle probes. Um, they, you take the bark off the tree, you insert these two needle probes into the xylem. The lower needle is a heater. The upper needle is a, a string of temperature sensors, thermocouples. You heat up the water in the xylem and you watch it move by the upper uh, string of temperature sensors. We put a series of these around the circumference conference of the tree and cover it with aluminum foil and run it off uh, data loggers. Now this particular type of sat flow sensor can only remain in a tree for four or five days at a time. Uh, after that time, the tree recognizes that there's this damage or wound zone and shunts water around the sensors. So only for a few, relatively few numbers of days can we record water flow up each individual tree. So we've progressively worked our way across the riparian 
zone with these sap flow sensors looking at a water flow of the trees. We've also gone into the canopy of the trees and cherry pickers, uh, looking at real-time measurement of CO2 and water exchange on a leaf scale, basically clamping off individual leaves and looking at uh, CO2 and water exchange uh, via that mechanism. And I'm using we a little loosely there. Uh, really, that's graduate students have gone up in uh, cherry pickers. We also have uh, right adjacent to the site a weather station looking at wind speed and direction, rainfall, solar radiation, actually global irradiance, uh, temperature, relative humidity, barometric pressure. From these measurements, we calculate a reference evapotranspiration parameter, a parameter that characterizes how conducive conditions are for evapotranspiration at any given time. And we also have a US stream gauge, USGS stream gauge at the site measuring dis stream discharge uh, through time. And you can see from this, this is five years uh, of uh, data. I'm going to walk, walk out of that uh, camera. But you can see that we've only got a few uh, periods of stream flow in the last four to five years. Each one of those periods is actually due to storms and local tributaries. It does not indicate flow down the main channel of the Arkansas River. We have not had any water flow down the main channel of the Arkansas River in the last four to five years. All of this is via local tribute storms and local tributaries. Um, so that's basically what we have at each of these sites. The Ashland site, we don't have a stream gauge, but other than that, that we're basically uh, the, the same setup there. Okay, now what I want to do is at that Larned site, describe the two phases of work that we've done there. You remember the first phase is directed at unequivocally demonstrating that these diurnal fluctuations that we're observing at the site are a product of phreatophyte activity. Now, if they are, those fluctuations should have a distinct seasonality to them. In other words, you should see them during the growing season, but not during the winter. Now, these are deciduous trees that are losing their leaves in the winter, so the transpiration should be very limited during that time. So let's look at that issue. And what I'm going to do is take five of the 14 wells that we have in that upper Arkansas River alluvial aquifer that are representative of a whole well set and just use water level data from those wells to demonstrate a few points. And let's start off looking at the seasonality of those fluctuations. This is an aerial photo from the year 2000. I chose this photo because there was actually water flowing in the Arkansas River at the time. Notice the water flowing. Notice the beaver dam and the pond behind it there in the lower portion of the photo. Obviously, conditions have changed dramatically today. Now, what I'm going to do is take one well, well LWPH3, and I'm going to show water level records from three different times during the year. Now, I chose these three times because the water table position was essentially the same at each of these times. So we're controlling for water table position. Okay? So let's look at what we've got. This is uh, time and days, the five day segments. Uh, this is water table position there on the Y. Now, I've adjusted water table position just for purposes of illustrative clarity. I haven't changed scales or anything, uh, just to make it, to separate out the plots a bit. Again, uh, in all three periods, we were within five centimeters of one another. In this case, 2.1 meters below land surface water table position. Notice in early spring, there at the bottom, you've got basically uh, nothing to see in terms of the diurnal fluctuations. These, the trees have not leafed out at this period. So transpiration is, is, quite, is virtually negligible here. We go into late spring, the trees have leafed out, and notice you have a clear pattern of this diurnal rise and fall of the water table. Go into midsummer, and it accentuates, it continues into late uh, September, and then begins to die back. And by this time, or within a few weeks from now, uh, the end of October, early November, tends to disappear with the first killing frost. So the pattern we're seeing th through the year is consistent with this idea that these fluctuations are a product of uh, phreatophyte activity. Now, 
if the major repairing of these uh, phreatophytes in the riparian zone are the major players here in these diurnal fluctuations, we should also see a pattern in space. Now let's look at that uh, issue as well. We'll take four uh, wells here, uh, beginning LWPH6 on the far west side of the riparian zone in an area of low density of phreatophytes, um, particularly the cottonwood and willows, um, and, and on the edge of the repairing zone. Well, LWPH2 in the center of a grove of cottonwoods, high density of... Uh,